Hey guys, as you may or may not know, I love to edit on a MacBook Pro and I use Final Cut Pro to do all the editing. However, I've been using the same 2017 MacBook for a while and I love it. It's a great 15 inch MacBook, but I wanted to add a couple of monitors. I wanted to streamline my workflow. And frankly, as I've been putting more and more effects on stuff, I really wanna see whether or not I can get a little bit more life out of it by changing the video card. So here, we're talking about the Vega 56. Let's benchmark it and see what's good. Y'all ready? I'm Brandon, and this is another SOC review. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Now let's go. <laughs> it's another exclusive. Uh huh. Yeah. SOC and Marlo. So, let's get it. Let's go. Come on. Yeah. Remember when I just a tap on. So it all starts with an external GPU, external graphics processing unit. It's a device that's used to add an external graphic card. And as these graphics cards get more and more powerful, they can provide multiple screens, manage higher resolution content, and even provide editing of multiple layers of 4K content, which is what's really important for me. The reason for one is really that it's basically an enclosure for you to put whatever graphics card of choice to meet your needs. And this makes sense for me because I want the portable flexibility of the laptop, but with some desktop office usability. There were a few GPUs for Macs to consider, but I went with the Razer Core Chroma. The Razer Core X comes with standard power cable, a Thunderbolt cable, and you can see some of the components here as I unbox it. But one nice thing is that it's all Thunderbolt. And so I can just use a single cord and boom, my whole setup is there. It's like a replacement for the docking station. You might recall the Thunderbolt cable dock that I've been using for a while, which was really tremendous. But given this new setup, I am basically using the Razer Core X as a replacement for that and also getting some more processing power. The Thunderbolt cable that comes with it's pretty small, so it's likely necessary to get a larger one, but it's important to pick the right one, which I'll put a link into the description for the one that I recommend. Pluggable actually makes one. It's the manufacturer of that previous dock I spoke of, but Razer also sells one as well. It's all about making sure the highest transfer rate is possible, which typically means a shorter cable. Now, there's the Razer Core X, and then there's the Razer Core X Chroma. I went with the Chroma because, again, I can use it like a desktop docking station. It comes with four USB ports, um, but I would say I don't recommend using a hard drive with it. You can use it for low bandwidth peripherals like an audio interface or charging, those sorts of things, but certainly not an SSD or hard drive because the graphic performance will take a hit. It also comes with sufficient wattage to power my MacBook Pro, which requires 87 watts of power, and there's no issues here. And it provides up to 100 watts, which could probably deal with any of the big deal laptops, even the higher horsepower ones for video editing. The other thing that's nice here is it won't get old. It can be upgraded, which is unlike the Blackmagic eGPU, which you might see otherwise. Well, as an aside, uh, it can also be used as a CPU holder um, within my desk, and that's actually how I have it fitted right now. So it fits underneath my desk perfectly, right out of line of sight. And shout out to iMover, which was where I got my desk as well with the review here in the top right. Now, onto the graphics card. I really debated on which graphics card to use, and ultimately, after a whole bunch of research, I went with the Radeon Vega 56 GPU. The Vega, because it's known to be compatible with Mac. The 56 was really good because it was right at the price point before going to the 64, where the speed and cost really exceeded the value that I really needed. And if I would have really gone bigger, and I could have put more in it, the Radeon 7, any of these other ones, man, I might as well just purchase a new machine and I didn't need to purchase a new machine. And in this case, I went with a MSI with an AirBoost. Now this particular card allows for four monitors to be used, three DisplayPort and one HDMI. I, as you might recall, I converted two 27 inch DisplayPorts and I also have this 4K LG monitor, which is rolling really cool. So I went with the ultra wide in the middle and go with two portrait 27 inches, which is the setup I'm using today. I'm using three connections now, but I could add one if I ever find the need. Installation was really quite simple. I mean, there's no need for detailed information. I was ready to go in like 10 minutes. You unbox it, open up the casing with a simple single latch, insert the video card, and the video card connections are already there, so you don't need to purchase anything different. Just connect the I.O. at the top to power it up, and you're all good based on the GPU that you purchased. All set to go. Now, the big deal at the end of the day is performance. And one way is you can start to look at performance is looking at your activity monitor, at least on the Mac. And here you can visualize the processing speed across the different cores of the CPU. You can also see the draw on the graphic processor as well. And it gives a pretty good visual indicator on the benchmarks. So if you're into the data like I am, you gotta go back to ultimately what your requirement is. You can get all sorts of distractions by these numbers. But for me, it was video editing with multiple layered effects like LUTs and multi-cam edits at the same time. 
I'm typically using Final Cut Pro X, so it's important that it's friendly with that architecture. Now my computer you can see here is a 2017 15 inch MacBook Pro, 3.1 gigahertz, four core with the processor. It has 16 gig of RAM, DDR3 RAM, and it's running Mac OS on Catalina. And it also comes with two GPUs internal to the MacBook Pro. One's four gig of memory on it, the Radeon Pro 560. And then there's the Intel HD Graphics 630, which is like 1.5 gig of RAM. Now onto the types of benchmarks. Well, there's the Geekbench benchmark. Geekbench, you can go there, free download software. They've just come out with Geekbench 5, which is a really good cross-platform benchmark. And what you can do here is you can look at three things. Geekbench measures system performance. There's the computing performance, so that's the raw power across a single or multi-core system or activities. You've got graphics, which could be like Metal or OpenCL. OpenCL means the most for me as a graphic editor or a video editor. And then you could do cross-platform tests and those sorts of things. There's another one which is a pretty graphic intense benchmark which is called the Heaven benchmark. And that's a GPU benchmark that pushes graphic cards to its limits to try to determine the stability of the processor under real stressful conditions. It's one of the standards. So the following numbers I'm gonna share are the Geekbench benchmarks and the Heaven benchmarks. As you can tell, I'm a bit of a data guy. So as I run the Heaven benchmark, you can see a couple scores here across the different cards. There's an overall score of 374 for the internal 560 Radeon that comes inside the Mac. Whereas for the Vegas 56, it's 1047. That is a complete improvement. You can look at the frames per second where it was like 14.8 frames per second. That's the speed at which it can truly, truly compute using the internal graphics card under high stress. And for the Vegas 56, it was 41.5. Again, a big jump in performance. And there's certainly a minimum and a maximum, and I think it's interesting to see the maximum got all the way up to 83 frames per second. Now, if you're thinking about gaming and that sort of thing, you're looking at 60 frames. So, hands down, we see the improvement. Now, when we look at the Geekbench benchmark, there are two types. There's OpenCL and there's Metal. For OpenCL, it's around 16,000 for the internal Mac. And when we look at the new Vega inside the GPU, we're looking at 50.5 thousand. So again, a big improvement. And then when you jump over to the metal benchmark, it goes from about 16,600 to almost 41,000 on the new one. So bottom line, if you were coming to just cut to the chase, the eGPU is performing at two to three times as fast as the MacBook Pro alone. And that's made tremendous difference in my editing and ProRes. And so the increase in horsepower by adding the eGPU, it's there. So after that, I guess we'll just get over to talk about some final thoughts. So a few final thoughts about the Vega 56. Hey, what can I say? Three to four times faster. All the benchmarks. It seems to be working. Now the question is, is it worth uh, the extra, say, $800 because I put it in an um, external GPU uh, to connect to my MacBook Pro? For me, the answer is yes. I think I'll get another year or two. It's going to fit all of my needs given the fact that I get the multiple screens, I get one single cable connection, Clearly it's running faster. I can edit multiple 4K streams with no issue. That's gonna help me out on some of the most intense things I do like music videos or any other creative content. So for me, it works. If you don't already have one, you may jump in and uh, get a new MacBook Pro, but hey, I'm saving maybe a third of that cost. I'll get a bit more time out of it. But all in all, as always, you guys know what to do. Appreciate you uh, checking us out and we'll talk to y'all the next time. Peace.